very strange to not have spoken to you yet this morning, um, but I'm excited to be here with you this morning. Um, I want to do something a little different um, that I, than I would normally do. I want to ask that we can take a moment and pray specifically for a need. Um, there's a member of our church here whose neighbor and friend in uh, Las Vegas, their mother has passed away and they leave two children, a 13-year-old boy and a 10-year-old girl. And so... Um, Man, that's got to be hard for that family. So let's pray right now together. Father God, we just, we lift this family up to you, Lord. Lord, you are the comforter, you are the great healer, you are the great consoler. Lord, you give life and you take life. And Lord, we mourn on this, on this side of heaven, Lord, because we are still uh, dealing with the effects of sin and the brokenness of this place. But Lord, even though we mourn and we are blessed that we mourn and you promise that you will comfort us, Lord, we have a better and greater hope. We know that death will one day end and go away. So Lord, I pray right now that you would bless this family, that you would encourage them, that you would give them strength in their tears, that you would bring hope in their despair, that you would bring uh, a, a dependence on your strength. Lord, I pray for people to go into their lives and to uh, speak scripture into their world, Lord. I pray for their friends and their close relatives that they would be strong bulwarks that they could lean on. Lord, as far as it is concerned for us, I pray that you would use us as is your will to help this family. Lord, we beseech you that you would reach out and bring healing where there is so much hurt. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. This morning, if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to the book of Luke. We are in chapter 7, and this morning we're going to tackle a larger chunk than we normally uh, tackle, which I think is going to be rather fun. Uh, And as you're going there, I want to just talk very quickly about an idea uh, in sports. Um, So everybody knows track and field, I'm sure, at least somewhat, and we know what a relay race is. And for a second, I want you to imagine what happens in a relay race. Now, I'm not talking about the ones at the elementary school playground, right, or with your friends outside. I'm talking about serious, collegiate, maybe Olympic-level relay racing. If you ever watch those, the most interesting thing is when the person with the baton is running as fast as they can to hand it to the next person, that person is not standing still. They begin to run and get close to full speed Before the person gets there, and as that baton is passed, both men are running. But there's a moment where that baton touches the other person's hand, where they're both holding it, and the one that delivered the baton lets go. And that person knows that their job in that race is done, but they don't just stop suddenly, right? Their knees would probably crack in half or something like that, right? It takes them a few steps to slow down. Now, that's kind of a crazy thing to talk about, but this is the image of what we're about to see today in the Gospel of Luke. We're going to look at a situation where John the Baptist comes to the point in his ministry that he realizes he has not only handed the baton to Jesus, but he has let go and his ministry is now over. And we're going to see a picture of how Jesus is going to tell us that the new and better thing is here and no longer should we be following John or or looking to him now, the thing that John gave the baton to, the thing that John pointed to, that is now the new reality. So if you have your Bibles open, I'm going to begin this morning in chapter 8, excuse me, verse 18, and we're going to go all the way down through verse 35. Let's let's read uh, God's word together. It says, Then John's disciples told him about all these things. So John summoned two of his disciples and sent them to the Lord, asking, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? When the men reached Jesus, that's him, they said, John the Baptist sent us to ask you, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? 
At that time, Jesus healed many people of diseases, afflictions, and evil spirits, and he granted sight to many blind people. He replied to them, Go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor are told the good news. And blessed is the one who isn't offended by me. After John's messengers left, he began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swaying in the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothes? See, those who are splendidly dressed and live in luxury are in royal palaces. What then did you go to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is the one about whom it is written. See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, no one is greater than John, but the least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And when all the people, including the tax collectors, heard this, they acknowledged God's way of righteousness because they had been baptized with John's baptism. But since the Pharisees and experts in the law had not been baptized by him, they rejected the plan of God for themselves. To what then should I compare the people of this generation, and what are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to each other. We played the flute for you, but you didn't dance. We sang a lament, but you didn't weep. For John the Baptist did not come eating bread or drinking wine, and you say he has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by all her children. Let's pray together. Lord, this is your word. Every word, every statement is a part of you. It is truth. It is righteousness. It is the only way in which we can know who you are. Father, I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to its truth, that not only would we learn what it means to the people it was written to, but also how it can transform our lives, not to be better humans, but to be more like you, Jesus. I pray, Lord, that in the preaching of this word, that starting with me and all the rest that are in this assembly today, Lord, that we would grow to love you, adore you, and devote ourselves to you even more by what we hear from this passage today. And we ask all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Today, the point of the message is this. Faith is produced by the words and deeds of God as he reveals them in time on earth. Faith is produced by the words and deeds of God as he reveals them in time on earth. As we work through the passage, it can be divided into four parts. The first, verse 18 to 23, we're going to see that Jesus answers John's questions with deeds and not with words. And then in verses 24 and 28, we'll see that Jesus affirms John's ministry as fulfillment. In verses 29 and 30, we'll look at how Jesus' message is good news to sinners. And then finally, in the last Four verses, 31 to 35, we'll see that the self-righteous can never be convinced. So what happens in the beginning of this passage? Jesus has just finished uh, healing the centurion's servant. He has raised a man to life. He spent time on the plain teaching this magnificent sermon of great kingdom truths. And at that time, which we see here in the very beginning, in that very hour, are John's disciples come and they ask Jesus a question. See, John's disciples were telling him all of the things that Jesus was doing. And John had concerns. So he summoned two of his men and simply said, go ask him then. If only we in the Christian church would just ask what somebody means, how much fighting would end. Sorry, I didn't, I just thought about that. Did you really mean what you said? Man, we'd we'd solve so many problems. I digress. But he says, listen, go ask him. Is he the one to come? Is he the one that I came to prepare the way for? So John's men, they go to Jesus and they ask him this question. But I think it's important to frame why this question was asked. You see, John is not at the river anymore baptizing. He's not actively performing his ministry. He's in prison. Do you remember? 
chapter 3, verse 19 and 20, a few months ago, it said, but when Jesus, or excuse me, when John rebuked Herod, that was the king of that area, the Tetrarch, because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and all the evil things he had done, Herod added this to everything else. He locked up John in prison. So these disciples of John are going to him in prison, ministering to him there, visiting him, showing him some compassion and comfort, and they're also saying, hey man, this Jesus guy did some great, like, like God spoke when you baptize him, yeah, this is what he's doing. And John is concerned. John is concerned because no longer is John front and center in the ministry of God in time on earth to God's people. He's now on the sidelines and he's maybe feeling a little bit awkward. See, he's hearing what Jesus did. John's disciples, after all, told him about all these things. He's hearing about the contents of Jesus' teaching. He's hearing about the healings that he's doing. He probably heard about the resurrection since all these things, that's included in that. He's hearing about Jesus' dinner parties with sinners and tax collectors and all the great conversation that's happening. And he's hearing about surprising ideas that Jesus is teaching to many people. He's saying, remember Jesus says, love your enemies. That's what John's hearing. Jesus said, what, the Messiah, the deliverer, love your enemies? Jesus is saying, bless those who curse you. Treat evil people with love and mercy. From John's perspective, this is a far cry from what the law prescribes, is it not? John was an expert in the Old Testament. He might be thinking, where is the justice? I mean, after all, interpersonally in the Old Testament, when you sinned, there was a real, tangible, physical penalty. And here's the Messiah, and he's saying, love your enemies. Do good to those who do evil to you. And, and, and speaking nationally, John's got to be thinking, Rome is still here. Rome is still ruling us. This Jesus is out there doing all these things. Why, why is Rome still here? You see, John's message, if you remember, was really intense. Here's what he said back in chapter 3. John answered them all and said, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I am is coming. So this is what John's question is. Are you, Jesus, the one who is to come that I have been preaching about? Notice here, though, remember, John is not preaching out of his own wisdom. God is giving him the words. He is compelled to speak this. It says, John here says, I am not worthy to untie the strap of the one to come sandals. And then he says, that one to come will baptize you with the Holy Spirit ready and fire. His winnowing shovel is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn. But the chaff... He will burn with fire that never goes out. That's a very intense message. That's like, hey, the one to come is going to come and wreck shop. Justice is going to prevail. God's enemies are going to be burned and his people are going to be blessed. But this is not what John's eyes and ears are hearing and seeing from his disciples. John is hearing the opposite of this. Yeah, Jesus is healing people. He's doing these amazing things. But, but to be fair, so did some prophets, minus the raising of the dead. If Jesus not, is not the one to come, he's got to be thinking, then who is? Did I fail in my ministry? I mean, if you were in that prison cell, maybe you would feel the same way. See, what we're seeing here is the humanity and fallibility of John. John is not God. John is not Jesus. John is a normal human being who happened to be called out to be a prophet. Like us, it's easy for doubt to creep in. It's important not to let our fallible perspective of Jesus to tempt us to doubt who he is. Do you sometimes have doubt? Do you sometimes confuse the Jesus of the Bible with the Jesus of your own making? If you haven't done that, then you're not really a Christian because that's part of humanity, right? We have doubts all the time. We must remember what he has revealed to us in his word and through the works in his earthly life. That's Jesus. In other words, when we doubt, we must do what? We must look at the book and remind ourselves who Jesus is. Now, John is in prison and he's about to look at the book. He just doesn't know it yet. We'll get there. John may have been slightly persuaded by the religiously accepted and frequently repeated ideas of what most assumed the Messiah would be. We've said this before as we've gone through Luke, the 
idea of who the Messiah would be by most religious Jews was a conquering king that was a political figure that would come in and geopolitically rid Israel of their invading Roman uh, you know, empire people and reestablish the kingdom of Israel a la King David, King Solomon. Of course, that's not happening. But we need to know that Jesus is far better than any of these preconceived notions or perceptions. Jesus did not come on earth to fortify or affirm what the men of the day believed the kingdom would be or look like. In fact, Jesus came to reveal a better reality, a kingdom not like any earthly form of government, a kingdom without borders, and a kingdom without limitations. Jesus came to reveal spiritual truth to a broken, hurting, and sinful world. So how did Jesus respond? What did he say to John's disciples? It says at that time, other translations say in that very hour, the Greek means right away. It wasn't a day later. It wasn't over a period of time. Jesus, remember, he's around crowds at this point in his ministry all the time. He doesn't answer them verbally. He starts doing what? Deeds and actions. He healed many people of diseases, afflictions, and evil spirits, and he granted sight to many blind people. Then he spoke. He replied and said, go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor are told good news. So Jesus answers only in the way that God could answer. He healed, he delivered, he gave sight at that very moment. There was no verbal affirmation or correction, just simply this, go and report what you've seen and heard. What did you experience, disciples of John? Go tell them. Jesus is actually telling John in this moment, look at the book. How? Well, when Jesus says, go tell him what you've seen, and Jesus says the blind have received their sight, the lame walk, etc., etc., Jesus did just do that. That is true, but he's also quoting scripture. He's telling John, in your disciples' sight, I have fulfilled the scripture that you know so well. Isaiah 26, 19 says, Your dead will live, their bodies will rise. Awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust, for you will be covered with the morning dew, and the earth will bring out the departed spirits. Jesus just fulfilled that. 29, 18 to 19 in Isaiah says, On that day the deaf will hear the words of a document, and out of a deep darkness the eyes of the blind will see. The humble will have joy after joy in the Lord, and the poor people will rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. Jesus is the Holy One of Israel. Jesus is fulfilling that in their presence. Verse 35, five to, excuse me, chapter 35, 5 to 6. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf, unst- deaf unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute will sing for joy for water will gush in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Remember that paralytic that Jesus said, your sins are forgiven? And when people didn't believe that he could do that, he said, what's easier to say your sins are forgiven or get up and walk? And the parasite, no, paralyzed man got up and I I don't know if he left and skipped like a deer, but that would have been funny, right? That would have been cool. I would have if I walked for the first time. Then in Isaiah 61, one, the spirit of the Lord God is on me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners. Jesus just fulfilled that. Jesus is unequivocally telling John, the answer to your question, John, is yes, I am the one that has come. I am the one that the scriptures speak of. And ready, I am God himself. When you look in these passages in Isaiah and you read the context of those four different sections, one phrase that is repeated over and over again is this, the Lord has done this. So if the Lord has done this, and this is speaking of the Messiah, and Jesus is the Messiah, then who is God? Jesus. It's more than just saying I'm the Messiah. Jesus is giving his full curriculum vitae. Is that the right way to say it? That's the new thing, right? Used to be a resume, now it's a CV, right? So Jesus is saying unequivocally. And then Jesus says this, and blessed is the one who isn't offended by me. So to know that Jesus is Messiah means that John and us and all people need to change our presuppositions about who and what the Messiah is and should be. 
we need to recognize that Jesus is the clear fulfillment of all Scripture and all prophecy. And we should not be dismayed by who we thought He was supposed to be when we learn the truth. Jesus is revealed to each person in His Word and nothing else. So to know Jesus, to believe in the true Jesus of the Bible, we need to believe that Word of God. We need to trust in that Word of God and we need to embrace that Word of God. John preached that the one to come would separate the wheat and the chaff. He proclaimed that the chaff would be burned, right, with fire. Yet what John saw was Jesus displaying mercy, compassion, forgiveness, and grace, and allowing certain evils to continue in the world while he was here performing these very works. John's imprisonment is not the least of those things. But like so many, John hoped to see a physical kingdom, a historical happening that would bring earthly defined deliverance. In contrast to this, Jesus actually brought something much better and effective. An invisible kingdom that heals, redeems, and corrects a sinful and flawed world. See, Jesus brings a kingdom that has an ID card that is the Holy Spirit living in the heart of believers. And the capital th- city of that, of that kingdom is the throne room of God in heaven. Jesus reveals the true nature of God. How He is merciful and compassionate. And yes, Jesus did come to talk about God's justice. So to not be offended by Jesus is to embrace the true Jesus and the true plan of deliverance that only He brings to humanity. And after Jesus answered John's question, He affirms John's ministry as fulfillment of Scripture. So Jesus turns to the crowd after this interaction with John's disciples and He says some rhetorical questions. He says, What did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed swaying in the wind? He says, did you go see a man dressed in fine clothes? That's what soft clothes is, right? Real nice, velvety things. He's like, no, those guys live in royal palaces. He said, did you go to see a prophet? Absolutely, he says. Yes, a prophet. And more than a prophet, he says, he says, this one is the one that it was written. See, I am sending you a messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare your way before you. What does it mean he's not a reed? See, John was a firm, resolute, strong man of God. He wasn't like one of these in vogue teachers of the day that would gain a following and teach something and then change his mind later. John had a message. It was an intentional one, and he said it uncompromisingly. He was not insecure. John was also not sold out to the religious elite and the Roman emperors and all of those uh, money men, if it were. They were all found in their pleasure palaces, John was found in the desert where there was no pleasure and no comfort preaching a message of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus says, no, he is a prophet. And Jesus confirms this. John was sent to speak for God about God. And he was more than just a regular prophet. What did Jesus mean by that? How many of you all were here during uh, Advent and we went through Malachi? This is why. Malachi 3.1, See, I am sending, or excuse me, I'm going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. Then the Lord you seek will suddenly come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant you delight in. See, he is coming, says the Lord of armies. So Jesus, who is God, is telling the crowds, John is the very one that that famous scripture is speaking about. Maybe there was some confusion in the crowds. It sounds like Jesus is being kind of sarcastic to them disciples. Maybe John isn't all that great anyway. No, Jesus says, that's not it. He was handing me the baton and he has to let go now because it's my time. In another gospel, John himself will say to his disciples before his arrest, he must increase and I must decrease. If only that were the motto of our Christian lives. He increases and we decrease. Jesus is reassuring the crowds Despite John being in prison, despite his new status as enemy of the state because he called out Herod's sin, John is indeed a prophet of the highest order. And this is Jesus, the Messiah, publicly endorsing John and the ministry that he performed. It's also an affirmation to those who received John's 
baptism that they did the godly and right thing. And then Jesus doubles down on his praise of John and defines John's role in comparison to his. He says, I tell you, among those born of women, no one is greater than John, but the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. See, John is the last of the Old Testament, or I like to think of Old Covenant prophets. He's the summation of all of those Hebrew names we read about. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Amos, um, Habakkuk. That's the one nobody knows, right? Because you skip over it by mistake. I'm just kidding, right? All of these prophets have their end in John. He is the greatest of all of these prophets, but we have to understand what Jesus is saying. His ministry at this point in time is complete. It's finished. It's done. John represents the law and the covenant of promise. What is that? That's the very simple agreement that God made with humanity that says, if you obey what I tell you to do, I will bless you. But if you disobey, I will curse you or punish you. See, Jesus is teaching that the worst and the least in Jesus' kingdom is superior to anyone under the old covenant or the law. The kingdom Jesus reveals is what John came to point forward to. It is the end goal and fulfillment of all prophecy and promises of God. The spiritual implication of this is that those born under the law, which John is the best one of all of them, have nothing on a single person who is a born-again believer in Christ. You see, every human being on earth, when they are born into the world, even now, is under the law. They are under the old covenant. They are under sin. Paul tells us this in Galatians. In Galatians excuse me. And so you can be the best law keeper that you can try to be. You can keep the Sabbath. You cannot wear clothes with mixed fabrics, right? Like, you can try to do all of that, but you will never do it perfectly. And so you need Christ, you need His forgiveness, His perfect law keeping to be accounted to you. And so the worst Christian, if there even was one in God's eyes, you are Jesus, right? In God's eyes, you are clothed with the image of Christ. But the worst Christian is far superior than the best law keeping unsaved person. And this is the image that Jesus is describing here. The reason that there is no one under the law that could outdo the least in the kingdom is because if you're in the kingdom, it means God lives in you. If you're in the kingdom, it means the Holy Spirit is in your heart. This does not mean John was not saved. This does not mean that he didn't go to heaven. Of course, he was redeemed as a saint. But what he represented in his ministry was not the ministry of grace that Jesus brings. Jesus is teaching the crowds that while John was necessary, while he was true and highly regarded in God's plan, it is what he pointed to and made a way for that matters most, and that's Jesus. Jesus is the revealer, the bringer, and the definition of God's kingdom. The encouragement and directive to the crowd is this, don't stop with John. Do what he prepared you for. Follow the one who has come, Jesus. Follow me. That's what Jesus is saying. Then we see that Jesus' message is good news to, to sinners. It's good news. See, the repentant rejoice at Jesus' truth. Notice in 29, Luke gives us a parenthetical description. He says, And when all the people, including the tax collectors, heard this, what Jesus said about John being the greatest of, of women and you know the least in the kingdom of heaven, all that, when they heard this, they acknowledged God's way of righteousness because they had been baptized with John's baptism. These people are the common people. They're the everyday guy that goes to work, nothing special. They're the ones that cheated on their taxes. They cheated on their wives. They drank too much alcohol. They're the tax collectors that were race traders because they sold their own people out to the conquering Roman army. They're the prostitutes. They're the ones that went to the prostitutes. They are the worst of the worst and they rejoiced at the truth that Jesus said to them. They rejoiced. These people embraced Jesus because they embraced John. They agreed that their sin was an offense to God, and they wanted to obey God. But the religious leadership, 
they reject Jesus' truth. In verse 30, it says it plainly. But since the Pharisees and the experts in the law had not been baptized by John, they rejected the plan of God for themselves. And that phrase is loaded. They knew Scripture the most. It says it right there, the experts in the law. That's the Bible, right? That's what that means. They were experts in it, and yet they rejected God's plan for themselves. Do you ever want to be told that you rejected God's plan? Man, that's pretty bold. See, they boasted great knowledge of God, but they rejected John, and so therefore they also rejected Jesus. They can't, they can't accept Jesus because accepting Jesus would mean accepting John. They rejected God's plan. What is that? His plan is Jesus. You see, you see how that works? You can't accept God's plan and reject Jesus. Jesus is the plan. And there's a double meaning of this for themselves, and I want you to see this here. It says they rejected the plan of God for themselves. So the first meaning of this is that as a group of people, as a subset, as experts in the law, Pharisees, right, religious experts, their group rejected God's plan. But it also means they rejected God's plan for their own plan. Do you see that? They rejected it for themselves. Themselves are their plan. It's about them and what they can do. It's about their rule following and their self-justification. This has been the theme of Luke. See, this brings us to something that we can put practical legs to in our lives as Christians. Obedience for obedience's sake is meaningless and saves no one. I want you to hear that this morning. Christians, we can fall into this religious trap if we're not careful. You can know all the riches of Scripture and quote every verse that's applicable in any given situation. You can know all the information in the greatest commentaries that have ever been written on the, on the New Testament or old. You can even follow and listen to great Christian celebrity teachers ad nauseum. I love John Piper. I like uh, Paul Washer. I mean, I could, I could give you a list. And a lot of you in here, I hear you talk about those same people and others. You can do all of that and you can still miss Christ altogether. You can still miss him altogether. See, obedience apart, ready, and this is important, from a soul focus, a soul love, a devotion to Jesus is no more than making yourself, the information you know, and the rules you obey an idol that you worship. You are not a Christian because of how much Bible you know. You're not a Christian because you know all the great Christian teachers online, TV, or in books. You're not a Christian because you obey every jot and tittle that Jesus said. You're a Christian because you have given your life and your trust to the Messiah. And you are allowing Him and trusting that He is the one working in you to make you saved. It's so easy to go down this slope. And I will confess to you, I am guilty of this. See, obedience must come as a joyful response from your relationship with Jesus, not your knowledge of Him. Obedience comes from your relationship. It must be involuntary like your heartbeat. It must be an unstoppable action that comes from an overwhelming desire to love and treasure Christ. Faithful and, and redeemed obedience is like a mosquito bite that you know you can't itch because it's going to get infected, but dang does it itch. And after a while, you're just like, ah, right? You scratch that sucker. That's what real obedience is. That's what salvific obedience is. See, the Pharisees and the scribes, they followed all the rules. They knew them all by heart. They could quote, and believe me, there were commentaries in their day, and they could quote them all. And they zealously followed and carefully listened to all the famous rabbis in Israel. Yet they rejected Jesus and John, the very ones that they all spoke about. Yet they believed their knowledge, obedience, ready, and their theological tribe made them righteous before God. In God's kingdom under the new covenant, only one thing and one thing only makes a person righteous before God. Here it is. I'll give it to you free of charge. Loving, trusting, and knowing Jesus with all your heart, all your mind, and all your spirit. That's it. 
Do you want to be the least in the kingdom to be greater than all those born of women? Then give your life to Jesus. Trust him, love him, adore him. Let him do the work in you. Here's the secret. You're not letting him do anything. If you're in Christ, he's doing it for you. He gave you the faith. And that's the true grace and the true miracle. In order to do that, to love and adore Jesus, we need to recognize that with God, you can bring nothing of yours to the table of salvation. You don't get to sit down at this peace treaty with God because that's what it is. It's the end of a war. Do you know that? You're at war with God before you're saved. You're sitting down at the table like the Japanese general and the, uh, the person, that, I think it was MacArthur, right, in the famous pictures on the aircraft carrier in World War II. You're sitting at the table with God. You have nothing that you can bring to that negotiation. You are valueless, you are hopeless, and you are far from sinless. And if you think I'm being rough, I'm not telling you that. That's what the word is telling you, and it means me too. But the good news is that when you turn from your plan and method of life, and you turn to Jesus and trust in his perfect life, his atoning death, burial, and resurrection, you can be made valuable, you can be full of hope, and you can be spotless from the stain of sin. The issue that we come in contact with here, though, the friction in our humanness is this. We can't stand that we don't get to have any part in that. There just must be something I can do to help. I need to feel like I earned it. You can't. You earned something, but it wasn't God's righteousness. Let go of your effort. Let go of your knowledge. Let go of what you think makes you a great person or skilled and embrace the only one that matters in any part of this universe or beyond, the perfect person and the finished work of Jesus Christ. He's all that matters. Finally, we see that the self-righteous cannot be convinced. Verse 31 Jesus says this, he says, to what then should I compare the people of this generation and what are they like? And when Jesus says this, we're like, "Uh uh-oh, here comes a confusing part. (laughs) This is going to be tough. So when he says this generation, he's not referring to everybody at that time. Most people agree, and here I am saying, don't believe in commentaries as your source of salvation, but certainly we can use them to help us understand what the word means. He's referring to Pharisees, scribes, religious Jews, the ones that said just a few words ago that they rejected God's plan for themselves. And it includes people today who trust themselves, they trust mankind, or maybe they trust science instead of God. Maybe they trust in a denomination or an affiliation over their relationship with Jesus. Or maybe, like many churches, they trust in an unbiblical Jesus, a Christianity, a version that's not rooted in Scripture, but in popular opinion. So what does Jesus say they're like? He says, they're like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to each other. We played the flute for you, but you didn't dance. We sang a lament and you didn't weep. I will admit this was confusing. This is a common uh, way of talking that really is referring to the idea of children in a marketplace playing games. So the idea of the flute playing and you didn't dance, it's like, hey, come and let's play a fun game together, right? The kids are trying to tell the other kids. And the other kids are like, no, it's too much. I want to go sit on my phone in the house. You know, something like that. And then the other guys are like, well, you don't want to do that. Okay, well, let me play it. Maybe you don't want to do something fun. Let's do something sad. So I'll play a sad song. Well, I don't want to play that that game either. That's too serious. That's too intense. That's literally the image that that he's writing here. I had a friend when I was a kid named Tommy. I won't say his last name. He's definitely not listening to this, but I'll just be safe. And uh, we lived in Norwood, Pennsylvania. It was a classic neighborhood, kind of like Tawanda, right? Lots of blocks and kids everywhere. And uh, we were at the age where we would play, act the shows that we liked, like Ninja Turtles, like we'd pretend we were a Ninja Turtle and go around the neighborhood and all that. Um, I think at this time, I actually was riding a Knight Rider bike. And it was me and Tom and this other kid, Andy, the three of us, And invariably, Tom would get mad because he would go, no, I don't want to be Donatello. I want to be Raphael. And if you don't let me be Raphael, I'm going home. And so, of course, as kids, we wouldn't do what we should have done and been like, all right, see ya. (laughs) Instead, we were like, all right, we'll be Raphael. And certainly, soon after that, no, I don't want to be Raphael. I want to be Donatello. He couldn't be pleased, could he? No matter what we did, that kid was going to complain. That's what this is showing here. That's the idea. 
So what does it mean biblically? And Jesus is going to explain the context right after that. In verse 33 says, John the Baptist didn't come eating bread or drinking wine, and you say he has a demon. And then he compares it with himself. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking. And you say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. See, like Tom and our friends, God cannot convince the self-righteous to play with him. That's a figure of speech. He's not actually asking people to play a game. It's actually very serious. Jesus is directly describing those who are rejecting God's plan. See, John was an aesthetic. That's what he's called. An aesthetic is somebody who does outward things to show holiness, right? He lived in the desert intentionally. He didn't have to. He did it. He didn't have any comfort. It said he wore rough clothes on purpose. He ate locusts and honey. He didn't cut his hair. He didn't drink alcohol, which was really unusual at the time, right? He did all of that because he was on a mission, and he was preaching a repentance for the forgiveness of sins, and he was doing it by choice. And what did these religious leaders say? They said, oh, he must have a demon. That's their excuse. But then here comes Jesus. He comes and he's God in the flesh. He meets sinners and traitors and the wicked where they are. He shows mercy and grace and compassion and, and, and ironically offers it to these very religious leaders as well. And what do they do? They say he must be a sinner himself. He's a glutton and a drunkard. So do you see? Nothing is worth it, right? Nothing convinces them. Be really holy and obey all these rules? You got a demon. All right, well, let's not do that. Let's be forgiving and let's enjoy things a little bit. Nope, I'm not going to believe in that either. See, when we trust in ourselves and our effort, intellect, and way of thinking, there is no part of God's plan that will appeal to us. Ever. Those who reject God's plan of salvation are truly rejecting Jesus. Simply put, they are unwilling to submit to the authority of the king of the kingdom because they want to be authority over themselves. And that's where it all comes down to, folks. Then Jesus ends with this statement, yet wisdom is vindicated by all her children. And everybody said, say what? Here's what it means. God's way will be shown to be right in those who are in Jesus. It's a proverb. It's a beatitude. It's a saying. God's way will be shown to be right in those who are in Jesus. See, the wisdom is God's truth. That truth will be shown to be right. How? God's children will confirm Jesus' truth through their lives and how they change, through the way that they worship and sing like we heard today in Hallelujah for the Cross. Bravo, kiddos. That was amazing and through their love for one another. That's how God's way will be shown to be right. So faith is produced by words and deeds of God as he reveals them in time on earth. Are you seeing that? This means that when we look honestly at scripture, when we hear who Jesus says he is, when we understand the works that he performed, there can be no doubt that he is the way of God's salvation. No doubt. We must also recognize and understand that rejecting God's way for our own way is an easy slope that we can slip and stumble on. We have to remind ourselves, our brothers and sisters, and all of God's elect that we can only know Jesus by looking to his word and we can only be justified before God by trusting in the perfect person and finished work of Jesus Christ. No amount of knowledge, forced self-obedience, Tribal affiliation or good works on our part can save, can give life, or allow us entrance to the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are so good to us. You provide a way for forgiveness where we deserve none. Lord, you made us in your image and we have sinned in that vain thinking that we are the God that created us, and we are not. We are not you, you are not us, and that's good. Lord, forgive us when we try to obey to earn your favor. Forgive us when we love what people say about your word more than we love your word. Forgive us, Lord, when we start to stray off the path. Bring us back, Lord. Treat us like that one sheep of the 99 and run after us. Lord, forgive us, but also Give us a heart of repentance and of singular focus to love you, adore you, and just be consumed by you. 
Lord, human words do not describe how we need to feel about you. Lord, help us just to continue to press into your presence, to abide in your truth, and to love like you have loved us. Father, we love you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.